True friends, true crime, and long nights. The right kid, the right place, the wrong time. Give me that drone chopping up in the sky of a small town splinter in the storm's eye. We ain't nothing but dark kid, I guess. We ain't nothing but dark kids. Welcome back, Dockheads. It's another week. It is Tuesday. No, it is Monday for us. It's Tuesday for you. Um, listen, this episode is brought to you by our good friends at Long Beach Jerky Company at LB Jerky Co. LBJerkyCo.com for all your beef jerky needs. You're going to be feeding your face with beef jerky anyway from somewhere. Don't go get it from a gas station. Go online, get you some Long Beach jerky. It's the best jerky in the universe. This is not even a paid advertisement. It's just me doing you a solid by letting you know that this is the best beef jerky in the history of drying cows out. So <laughs> do it right now. <laughs> I, Did you write that line? That's no, so it just popped in my head. But I have no copy to read from. It's, you know, they're just friends. Uh, I am here with, as always, comedian Chris Bowers. How are you, brother? Doing great, man. Excited. Great, great excited. This is a very special episode because we have a guest. We've never had a guest before. Um, Savannah Martin is a friend of ours. Uh, she listens to every episode and comments, uh, hilariously afterward. So we decided to bring her on for this one. Um, so Savannah, introduce yourself. Hi, I'm Savannah <laughs> and I am the funniest person that I know. Oh, great. Great. <laughs> we'll see. We'll see how she stands up here. It's a, it's a burn on both of us, Todd. I, I think it is. Both. Yeah. Cause she knows both of us. Uh, <laughs> But so she doesn't, have to pick, she doesn't have to pick between us, which is good. So yeah, yeah, exactly. Which one of us was funnier, that would put her in a weird spot. So if she no. if she's the funniest, then she's there. And well, yeah, because when you're funny, she don't care who's number two, to be honest. I care. <laughs> right. Yeah. Places All right. matter. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So this week, oh, by the way, to everybody who uh, thought we were going to be, Bowers and I were going to be in uh, Des Moines, Iowa, that has been postponed. That club is not going to open until November now. So that show's being pushed back. We'll let you know when it gets rescheduled. This week for Dockheads, we got a great one. It's, this is a very unique documentary in, in how it was uh, done and uh, what it's about and how from where it started to how it ends up is pretty, pretty cool. Um, it's The Amazing Jonathan. That's the name of it. It's on Hulu. You go to Hulu to watch this. All right. So right off the bat, let's just go around the horn and see what each of you thought in general about the documentary. Bowers, go. Well, first, I remember the Amazing Jonathan from when I was a kid. He was one of my favorite comics. He was really funny back then, um, <coughs> using the same jokes that he does now, which is weird. But anyway, uh, <laughs> but he was funny. But I will say, Todd, this is so confusing to me. I'm gonna, I'm gonna actually. There's the fifty percent of me thinks this was a real documentary, and fifty percent of me thinks this was, was a scripted movie as a fucking magician trick. And I don't know which. I mean, I'm literally down the middle. I believe. So I'm gonna talk about this this doc. I'm going to show my evidence of why I think it was a, a, a scripted movie and then also talk about if it is real, the ridiculous part of how real it was, but it was super fun. I had a great time with it, but I was real stoned. So we'll see. maybe that had. <laughs> <laughs> right. I might be partially that right now. Savannah, what did you think? Um, I am not stoned. Um, and I, I hated like 98% of it. Not going to lie. I was so mad watching the whole thing because you're right. Like it, it's not your normal documentary. And I like to see things coming and I saw none of it coming. Ooh. Um, uh, but yeah, uh, most of me believes that it's a real documentary, but that Jonathan, uh, the amazing Jonathan was playing tricks and not really knowing what he wanted. Yeah. And then ben was just really confused. That's what, okay, that's what I think. I, first of all, I love the whole documentary. I mean, the fact that it has surprises just means it's very well done, Savannah. So I appreciate your simple palate. But um, <laughs> it's, it's, this is more of a case of, I think, I think Bowers nailed it. I think you partially nailed it. I think 
Uh, Jonathan had his own agenda here, and Ben, our filmmaker, was getting fucked according to his own agenda. But I think he, I, I want to believe that he really caught this midway through, and then adjusted, and ended up making a fucking great documentary out of this, against all odds, because I think he's being sabotaged. I will say the 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 pivot that he had, and we'll and we can talk about the step by step of the documentary, but the pivot he does, and then the way he sell, I mean, like. This guy fucking strung gold out of a pile of shit better than almost anybody I've ever seen in my life. Like the fucking pivot and make it about him and his family once Jonathan wouldn't return his calls is just amazing. And then fucking Jonathan doesn't want to do it at all. And then he fucking has this brilliant way to sit to sign to get a producer to pay for it. And now (laughs) it's a big deal. I mean, it was amazing. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. So the amazing Jonathan available now on Hulu. Um Here's the description. What begins as a seemingly ordinary profile of a dying magician becomes an unexpected and increasingly bizarre journey as filmmaker Ben Berman struggles to separate truth from illusion. (laughs) Could have wrote it better myself. Shout out to Ben Berman. I really like this dude. Um, All right. So according to Wikipedia, for those that don't know, The Amazing Jonathan is the stage name of a comedy magician, John Edward Zells. His act is mostly composed of hijinks, interaction, and audience mem- with audience members, and a few legitimate magic tricks. That's what I remember of him. Like as a kid, he was a big deal. Like through the '90s, he was on Letterman and all the shows, all definitely all the variety shows. And I remember in particular, he had the thing where it looked like he sawed into his arm, and there was blood out everywhere. And when you're yeah, like yeah. a junior high kid, that's just the best thing you've ever seen when it yeah. comes to magic. So he was a really big deal. Made millions of dollars while doing it. He was a he was a, a big box office hit, and then all of a sudden it comes to an end. When according to him, he was diagnosed with cardiomyopathy, which is a terminal heart disease, and he's given one year to live in 2014. So yes, let's go from there. All right. <laughs> Well, first, let me say this. Uh, first, I want to question this, Savannah. Had you ever heard of the Amazing Jonathan before this podcast? No, before I was this, just about, document. I was just about to say that uh, you guys are old, and uh, <laughs> <laughs> I'd never heard of him before at all. Uh, I would not have liked his comedy. I don't think. Uh, I you don't think like cocaine comedy. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I would agree with you because. Everything that he did is what worked in the 90s in comedy. Uh, so it doesn't really transcend, I don't think, it beyond his, all, yeah. his, he, his he was, little window. He was actually my second favorite comic magician of the 80s. Do you remember Randy the Punk Magician, Todd? Do you remember that guy? No, I don't. He, he was this British guy, or maybe he wasn't British, but that he had an accent and he would go, I'm fooling you and you don't like it. And he'd pull out and he'd be like, fuck you, it's magic. And he was like, ready to fuck magician. Okay, I remember, remember that tagline. Fuck yeah. you, it's magic. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> he was like real mean to the crowd. And he was like, I'm fooling you and you don't like it. I used to say that all the time. It was like one of my favorite lines when I was a kid. So, you know, Major Jonathan was good, but he wasn't Randy the Punk Magician or, to me. But, you know, whatever. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, the documentary does start. I realize, uh, and it's, I don't know if this is a spoiler alert, but the amazing Jonathan is alive right fucking now. So that's the yeah. first step of it's 2020 this journey of September. <laughs> and, he's still and, alive. Yeah. So the documentary really begins like three years after he's diagnosed. So yeah. it's already, he's like already, you know, gone past his, uh, his, his, uh, his expiration date, uh, expiration date. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So when it opens, we see Jonathan at his his mansion with his wife, Anastasia, who you could tell was really hot back in the day, um, <laughs> where they live by the mantra, I would say, carpe diem. It's like a real seize the day type mentality because I, I could be dead tomorrow. So we just start every day just doing whatever the fuck we want to do, right? So do you see, though, even though you don't like his comedy, um, uh, Savannah, how this plays back in the nineties, like he was a big deal. Yeah, I can see that. Well, and all of his fans came back. So clearly like, I mean, I'm, I'm wrong here. I get that, but <laughs> no, you're not wrong. It's just comedy was not great in the nineties. That's all. <laughs> so he had a, he had a Vegas show too, from 2001 to 2014. So um, he was like, uh, you know, he had a, what do they call that? Um, shit, a residency in Vegas for like 
13 years, which is unheard of. I think he was the longest lasting comedy magic show in in Vegas history. So, yeah, yeah. yeah. Really big deal, this guy. Um, he was addicted to cocaine for 20 years, according to him in this, and then uh, progressed uh, into smoking meth. So, Power upgraded. to him. I mean, do what, do what you got to do to get through the day, I guess. Yeah. And I don't know. I don't. I think the meth started before the diagnosis, but <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, I don't know. And also, I don't know much about cardiomyopathy, but um, it would seem that meth makes you live longer. I don't know. He was only supposed to live a year. <laughs> Please do not put that out there in the world, Todd. Oh my well, heavens! Well, no, no. I think I think you're right, Todd, because if, if his if his if his heart only works ten percent, meth makes that ten percent like a hundred percent. That's yes. really like the, the yeah. Up. I mean, I, what, mm-hmm. I, I will say I he like probably has a with... normal heart rate when he's on meth. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, it's for eighty beats per, beats per minute on meth. Mm-hmm. Uh, but yeah, no. The thing I thought was cool about it, <clears throat> honestly, he was like. Hey, I know people want this this story of guy makes a bunch of money, then he does drugs, then he loses everything, then he stops doing drugs, then he gains everything back. He's like, <clears throat> I did all this stuff on drugs. I wrote all this stuff on drugs. I'd be success- successful on drugs. I've never stopped doing drugs, and I've never lost anything. And I'm like, well, yeah, if you're good at it, you're fine, right? Yeah. Like, <laughs> and also, he just, like he, he was he was like, I don't know how to perform not on coke or meth. Like it's just how I've always done it. I'm, I'm just saying there are people that, there's, well, there's people that drink their whole lives and it's never a problem. And you would never go, oh, I can't believe you drank. I mean, if you can smoke meth every, if you're the one guy to ever tame meth in the history of fucking meth, congrats, man. That's impressive. Right. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, and, and I do think there is state dependent memory. It's a thing. So it's, it would almost be like, a, it would be a huge adjustment for him to perform sober. Like his body doesn't even remember what that's like. So, you know, his timing and everything is related to that that state of being fucking really fast on meth or coke. Yeah. So, yeah, I don't know. More power to him, I guess. If I, if you got a year to live, why, why I mean, stop? Yeah, you're not going to stop. I mean, like, OK, literally, if they were like, hey, you have a, li- a year to live because you have a brain lesion. Nothing's going to make it worse or better. We would drink every fucking day, wouldn't we? We wouldn't oh, yeah. be sober for the last year. We'd fucking mm. just party balls till the, we fell yeah. over. I mean, that's well, kind I'm of the goal anyway. I'm going to stretch this out for two weeks. Fuck. I'm going to be <laughs> drunk the whole time. <laughs> to take it in a different direction, because this is probably one of my favorite scenes in the whole documentary, is when uh, his wife is talking about the fact that she didn't realize on their first date what he was actually talking about when he said that he does speed occasionally. <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> and she was like, but then I was fucked because I fell in love with him. And I was like, that's not how love works. That's not how life works. You could have left. Uh, she just, she was so whiny about it. And she like started crying at one point. And I was like, this is your life. You have chosen this path. Uh-huh. Uh, yeah. but, uh, I just, the dependency is, is interesting well, to me. Well, I love it. Actually, and I'll, I'll say this about the wife. I, I, if this is a real documentary and this, and this is real and he has had a year to live, <laughs> she's so pissed he's still alive. <laughs> Fuck. <laughs> she's been waiting for six goddamn years for this house and this pool and this money and not have to deal with this fucking meth head. But she's like, oh, he's got a year to live. I mean, probably she broke up with him. That's when he had this year to live thing happen. And she's been holding off for every fucking year. Like my favorite scenes when they're in Denver and she's schlepping bags and she's all pissed. And I'm like, yeah. yeah. She thought this dude should have been dead four years ago. She doesn't want to be <laughs> schlepping bags around Denver. She has to be laying in a pool being a millionaire. She's all pissed. I'm not even hot anymore. <laughs> That's a good point. I think I resonate with her a little bit more now. Thank you, Bob. <laughs> yeah, so she's not whiny. She's just pissed that this motherfucker either lied to her about dying or fucking hasn't died. She's just like, every day he wakes up, I'm like, another fucking day? Jesus God Christ. Damn it. <laughs> They show him smoking meth in his house, and then he shows off his DJ skills, which I thought was pretty cool. Um, but then he, uh, his wife starts talking about how upset she is about the addiction, like you were saying. And I'm assuming, um, you know, that pr- I don't. Does anybody know anything about cardiomyopathy? Like, what could it be caused from 20 years of being addicted to cocaine? Because I know that fucks with your heart. Let's just say, at the very least, it probably it's not making it better. Yeah, it didn't make it better. If not, the the <laughs> we cause were, of it. 
yeah, we were joking about earlier, but I mean, what I, I guess what I'm saying is that's where I started to think this wasn't real because he talks about how he does his health. And he takes 97 pills, but then he still smokes meth. I can't imagine I that's know. good for you if you have any sort of whatever. Now, maybe <laughs> I'm wrong. Maybe again, maybe that's the, maybe that is the thing keeping him alive. And he's like, you know, me not eating vegetables. Somehow it works. I don't know. Right. right? I'm just saying that like fucking <laughs> I will say we missed one line. I, they interviewed his mom and it was so funny. His mom said, yeah, he was such a good kid. I'm like, yeah, no bad kids end up being magicians. <laughs> Right? <laughs> you like to stay in the house a lot and fucking play with yourself uh-huh. if you end up a fucking close up magician is my point they also <laughs> squeezed in that one picture like moms like to do of you naked when you're three that's all yeah. I, yeah. just why shows his dick and all just so yeah. appreciate that mom <laughs> so he's coming out of retirement which is what spurred the whole documentary thing anyway to tour again at smaller venues, knowing it's not healthy for him and that he could theoretically die on stage, which they keep talking about throughout this. Um, and his first show back doesn't go great, right? So that first show back, he's got a lot of rust to knock off. He's not in, of good health. so But he's optimistic that it'll get better as he pursues this one last run. Quick quick side note, uh, while mm-hmm. they were doing the I own – or have owned four of the five sparkly coats he wore in this in this show. <laughs> nice. When you, when you come out on stage, people are expecting magic because of the way you're dressed. You always have yeah, a sparkly exactly. shoes on that match a sparkly uh, sports coat. And yeah, yeah the whole. The I, owned, whole I owned four whole of the tux. five jackets he wore. I'm like, oh, I've owned that one. Oh, I've had that. I almost bought that one, but it they didn't have it on my size. That was the fifth. The fifth one I almost bought, but they didn't have it on my size. Like, <laughs> so this is a little bit trip down memory lane for me, too, because I'm like, oh, I remember that coat. That was a fun yeah, one. Yeah, right. <laughs> Now, Savannah, as as a female, as a young female, how sexy was it when he would have to put on his toupee right before every performance? Oh, I came right there. I was so. <laughs> it was. It was. It was. It was hot. <laughs> you guys should try it sometime. I know. I'm thinking about getting one made. Like that, right before I put on my hat. This, just, this is a toupee. I'm already right. done. That's just that good. I can swim in it like the guy in the Goodfellas commercial. <laughs> so Ben, our filmmaker at this point, very excited. And he's got a great topic for a documentary and uh, it should, you know, he should be very excited about it. But then we break into a, a recorded phone call between Jonathan and Ben, our filmmaker. And Jonathan tells him that he's given permission to a second film crew to film a documentary about him while Ben films, films his. And he lets him know that the second film crew has won two Academy Awards uh, and are obviously a much bigger outfit. So they take yeah. precedent, basically. <laughs> and Ben's like, what the fuck? Like, I put all this work in, whatever, this far into this thing, and then you're letting a second, that's going to be weird, right? And they actually, you can see them in the background of Ben's shots and their, their faces are, he has to blur their faces. I mean, what an editing nightmare. They have to go back and do that extra work. Yeah. Cause they didn't want to be part of the doc. That was my favorite part of the whole thing is the yeah. second doc crew is like, no, we don't want to be in yours. Right? right. He's like, well, what, what do you mean? Like I got, I got, <laughs> we got two documentary crews. You're going to, I'm going to have to show you filming. That's be part of the story now. And yeah. they're like, nope. Blur us out and obscure our voices so you don't know who we are. He's like, God damn it. So he has all these blurred out people. It was so fucking funny. And that's, again, where I'm starting to think, okay, is this a real movie? Like, is this really happening? Or right. is this, like, fucking they're fucking with us? You know what I mean? Like, that's uh-huh. where it started to kind of, in my brain, go, okay, maybe this is a trick. Maybe this right. is a magic trick for Amazing Jonathan. Okay. The, the moment that Ben found out that he was becoming the side chick was just <laughs> so good to me. Like, I... I've never watched that happen in like real time. Uh, no, have- Bragger. <laughs> you, you- <laughs> what a brag. I'm the, I don't know what it's like to be a side chick, but I imagine going- Ben was pretty bummed about it. <laughs> she, she's going, I've gone from side to main, but never the other direction. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we're only leveling up in this life. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah. But that was probably... Those, er- Anything that happened like that, that was those were my favorite parts. For oh sure. yeah, I mean it was so uncomfortable. Like you could, I could feel it. It'd be like God, that would suck so bad. And then Ben, you know, he's uh, also he's in the car at one point with Jonathan, and Jonathan is letting him know, you know, hey, 
maybe I think it's a good idea if you release your documentary second after they release theirs because they're a bigger deal and your documentary can ride the wave of that, you know, because <laughs> they also did Man on Wire, he keeps saying, and, you know, they got an Academy yeah. Award. So... Yeah. That was fucking humiliating. Most, that was the most fuck you. Like, yeah, once yeah. once their good one comes out and is successful, then your piece of shit can be the other one people watch right. once they're in love with me again. Like, just <laughs> like, oh my god, because yours is obviously going to suck, right? Like, I've been I've been here. It's been terrible, right? Right, so. right. <laughs> and Ben's just so he's a he's a fucking stud, man. Like on the fly, he's always having to make these changes and decisions. And it seems like he always makes the right one. Like he's genius. So he was like, listen. I want to incorporate the fact that you have a second crew involved in this documentary. So I'm, I'm going to put that in mind. I'm not, so I'm not going to wait. That would, it, you know, it looks stupid if I, if I come out second because they're part of my documentary now, which I think is brilliant. And Jonathan's just, just not getting it. But the reason I think it's brilliant is because it totally illustrates like what kind of dude Jonathan is that he's so self-serving you know, so selfish and self-centered about everything. He's like, oh, I'm bringing in two crews. I don't care how that fucks you. I don't care how that fucks them. It's just more cameras on me, you know? Yeah, but I mean, on some level, Todd, I mean, let's think about this. Like, so if, so if some guy said, hey, I wanted a documentary about Todd McCombs, you're like, okay, cool. And he wasn't paying you. It's a documentary. And it's just a guy with a cam. I mean, you know, he's spending some money, but it's not a high budget thing. And then Sp Steven Spielberg called you and said, hey, I want to make a documentary about you. I'm Steven Speed Spielberg. You'd be like, oh, yeah, I'm going to have to do that. Like, right. You're the greatest guy I've ever met, Todd. But I think even you would have to like say to the now yeah. you, you would mention to the first crew you'd be like hey i'm so sorry and maybe i can have steven make you a, a, a fucking cameraman or something but i can't turn right. this down yeah I but think. i would have nutted the other one i wouldn't have straggled him along you know like you're totally making him the side chick you know like oh you can be here on uh, thursday because i don't have anything going on thursday it's you know? really cute that you think you could also have a side chick <laughs> <laughs> I think I think this is a little far fetched of an idea. Well, I get the concept. The theory, the theory is sound. I say, and go fuck yourself. So. I uh, now they, so they go to the Wilbury. He goes to the Wilbury Theater, and now we've got two dock crews. They are weirdness because they've already. They scattered out two camera positions and the one guy's like, well, where am I supposed to film? And they're like, well, we don't know. And so that was kind of fucking weird. But then Jonathan feels dizzy. And then he has this little speech, which I love about how, and he even says on stage, oh, he wants to die on stage. That'd be really cool. And yeah. then his wife goes in this whole thing about this, this magician who died on stage. And we laugh. Because, and I'm like, no, that's the best fucking possible scenario. Right. I mean, wouldn't oh, that be yeah. amazing? I mean, yeah. that's yeah. Especially like this Tommy Cooper video they showed really showed him die. They show that actual moment. So he that and that guy was like ninety, still touring or something. He looked old as yeah. shit, and he just he just collapses down to his butt, leans back, and the crowd starts. Going, the biggest laugh of the night, by the way, the biggest right. laugh he got the whole show. People are going I, crazy. Well, I I didn't know you went back and watched the whole show, Todd. But that's impressive. The, the homework you do for this podcast. <laughs> I'm just judging. I'm just guessing. <laughs> Since it was a big laugh. <laughs> And his act didn't look great. Uh, <laughs> no, you're you're right. Probably the best. Probably the best life he got in his whole career was dying, literally. Right, which, right. So. <laughs> <laughs> but but there, what a moment! Because people, I just thought it was part of the bit, you know. And then they find out, boom, yeah, he's really dead. For a magician to go, that's the way to go. There was a, there was an Australian comic that just happened. I think it was English or Australian. This just happened last year, where he he literally was in the middle of his act that he like had a headache and he goes, oh, geez, my hmm. Wouldn't it be crazy if I had a stroke and just died right in front of you guys? And then like 20 minutes later, he had a stroke and died right in front of him. Oh. And they it murdered. They were dying laughing because it was a callback and it was physical. He fell down and died. And they were and they literally then like after a while, people were like, Oh my God, I think he might actually be dead. Oh and they went God. up there and he fucking was. And it was like That's incredible. That's, it. That's the dream, man. I, I mean, literally love that. going out on a huge laugh. Are you kidding oh me? Oh my yeah. God. As you're tripping out, as you're like, oh, no, you just hear thunderous applause of oh. how fucking funny you are. Because you set up your death perfectly. That's called timing, my friends. Yeah, it is. It is. <laughs> I really like that kind of gonna be honest with you. I'm telling uh, you, man, that's 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 the that's the dream. <laughs> So I, I think it's worse for Ben too, because um, this this next show that they sh they show uh, Jonathan doing is at a much bigger venue. Um, he's at an actual theater again, and uh, he has to do radio 
promo for it. So he shows up to this, this do this radio spot, and both film crews are there. So they're asking him about it, and he introduces them, and he, this is how he introduces them. Okay, well, this is Ben. He's making a documentary, and this is the other more important film crew who made Man on Wire and Searching for Sugar Man, like two of the most critically acclaimed documentaries of all time. And uh, and Ben's just sitting there like, oh, yeah, getting fucked again, <laughs> right on national radio. And the radio guy keeps going on and on about how amazing Man on Wire was. <laughs> oh, yeah, the French guy is oh, walking yeah. between the two uh, Twin yeah. Towers. That was awesome. <laughs> I think I saw that boom mic in that in that show. That you, it was amazing. this is the same crew. I know it. Right. Uh, well, we well, this is also where we meet. I think my favorite person of the documentary, and I think it's Savannah's too, is Ben's best friend, the smartest person I've ever heard of. Right, mm -hmm. like his buddy gave him such perfect advice every time. Right, yeah. mm -hmm. like where he's like, you know, I mean, everything he said was just fucking gold. I mean, I just I just love this guy. Yeah, yeah he was a good sounding board. Yeah, I liked. the I like the way he thought he thinks a lot like the same way I do, I think just kind of logically and mm -hmm. just like a sound, like a, like very reasonable. And, uh, he's also a little cute in case anybody was wondering, um, <laughs> fun to watch. Uh, but yeah, definitely my favorite person of the whole documentary. Okay. All right. I can see yeah. that. Um, okay. He was like, this is, this is fucked up. You're being cucked, man. What are you doing? You're going to, you're, you're yeah, have some self-respect. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Like fucking, and then, and then just, but don't give up. No, no. Don't let him push you out. Fuck him. Just be passive aggressively in the way and positive, which right. is fucking the best advice I've ever heard anywhere. Like if somebody fucks you over, just be passive aggressively positive and just give them road bumps the rest of their goddamn life. Oh, rather absolutely. Than some blow up moment. It was fucking great. <laughs> well, and, and also that allows you to stay in there and get what you need. You know, you're this far into it. Why fucking blow this thing out of the water where you just have to scrap the whole thing. Yeah. So it's yeah. great advice. And by now, Jonathan, he's talking about, you know, being on stage. He's like, you know, I'm good for the first 15 minutes. Like the, I have the adrenaline going, all that stuff. I feel like my old self on stage for the first 15 minutes. When the adrenaline fades, then I'm struggling for the rest of the show. I have to sit down for part of the show. So it is a little bit sad to see that he is, uh, you know, like a, a older, watered down version of what he used to be on stage, which has to be because I'm trying to empathize with him a little bit. So far in this documentary, I'm thinking he's the biggest asshole I've ever seen. Right. So I'm trying to like uh, trying to find ways to empathize a little bit. And I'm like, you know what? I might be an asshole, too, if I was out there trying to do shows and I, I wasn't nearly as good as I used to be because the patheticness of it. Right. Well, then well, also the the idea of like you wanted to die and you just won't fucking die. Like he's come to grips with the fact that he's going to die. And then every day, I'm sure every day he wakes up just like his wife. They both go, God damn it. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to be this guy anymore. <laughs> Right. That's fair. I just, I'm very into like owning your actions. So like, if you're going to be an asshole, that's fine. I love it. I support it. Uh, but own it. Like, uh -huh. like, don't try to make it seem like you're not just, that's what you are. True. I just feel like, I feel like that's, I don't know. People have that, to respect the whole, that. Yeah. The whole like, I'm dying thing is not an excuse. Just yeah. own it. Yeah. I just have, I'm an asshole who happens to be dying. Yeah. I'm not right. an asshole because I'm dying. <laughs> yeah. So I was an asshole before I was dying. I'll be right. an asshole after I'm dead. Probably right. I'm just an asshole and that's okay. You know, we, we respect people that are just like, yep, I'm a dick. What are you going to do? Right. Sorry. Exactly. <laughs> We're like, well, all right. Makes sense. <laughs> it's when we try to like, even paper people are like, you know, when people are like, yeah, I'm kind of racist, man. You're like, oh, well, fuck. All right. <laughs> well, at least I know right up front. Yeah. <laughs> at least you know that you are and you fucking know that that's what your decision making. I mean, I don't like it. And I wish you weren't. But like, mm -hmm. at least you're not arguing that the things you're doing aren't racist because you're like, yeah, I'm kind of I'm like, well, fuck. Right. All right. I don't exactly I don't be, be friends with you anymore. But <laughs> <laughs> and also yeah. we're all here to see the Black Panther movie. So shut up. <laughs> <laughs> you're ruining it. <laughs> Just give me the popcorn. You shouldn't be working here on this night. What are you doing? <laughs> the premiere <laughs> so so now ben is really this is where it really gets interesting for me because now he's like navigating you know this real conflict that exists with the other crew and then just when he's trying to he, he comes up with a good solution of how to handle it he's sitting and talking to jonathan and jonathan's like oh by the way there's now a third film crew involved and he's like what so, yeah 
And this guy, you know, he's been working on this for the last two years, actually. Uh, so, yeah, he's going to be around, too. So, um, and he's like, what the fuck is going on? There's a third crew? And at yeah. first I thought well, he was just bullshitting, just trying to get a rise out of him. No, real dude. He meets yeah. him the next show. He's also cool as shit. I love that guy, too. That guy was, awesome. mm-hmm. was super fun. Ended up being a comedy juggler. Oh, yeah. Fuck. yeah. That's that's one step below, below comedy magician right. in the comedy world, I think, right? <laughs> but at least he juggled chainsaws. That's yeah. when you're getting oh, gigs. It was ballsy. It yeah, was yeah, ballsy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, and it's, it, what a slap in the face, though, too, because now you not only find out there's a third documentary crew. The guy's not even a real documentarian. He's just doing it on the side as a passion project. He has a decent little camera, and he's a fucking chainsaw juggler uh doing on the side he's like me like how i make documentaries every now and then right like right. you just you but, just go out with a camera and but ben also realizes that he's now actually the he's also horning on a dock that's already going right so yes. he can't be mad at the second crew because he's the second crew he's mad mm-hmm. at the third crew no he's doing the same thing to the first crew yeah it's just it gets all but and this is where it starts to be like okay this can't be real this has right. to be scripted it almost seems like too like, much like are right, you yeah. cucked this guy we didn't even know about it first with somebody who was a bigger filmmaker than him because he ch- juggles chainsaws. And then you cut this other dude with somebody because you think they have two Academy Awards under their belt. So it's just, but here's one thing we know about a lot of entertainers, especially very successful ones. They are pretty much about themselves. They're very yeah. selfish people. So it kind of is in line with that, you know? Yeah, there's a point where it doesn't even occur to them anymore because no one's told them no in a long time. Mm-hmm. So it's not even that they're selfish. They just people just do what they want all the time to get some of their money or some of their fame or some of their whatever. And it right. doesn't even occur to them that people would like other stuff other than that. Right. right. Like exactly. it doesn't even occur to them that I mean, and that happens. Chrissy's such a pleaser. Sometimes I'm like. You like this show, right? And she's like, no, not really. I'm like, oh, God damn it. We've been watching this for two seasons. <laughs> Fucking tell me. A lot. I, I don't, it's not a, that I'm just making that, you happy. God yeah. She, <laughs> she's like, yeah. I'm like, well, fuck. So I kind of get how it happens. If everybody around you just does everything for you all the time, eventually you just, you know. Well, it's, it's kind of, but Savannah knows what that's like. I, I would imagine. Um, probably yeah. people do whatever she wants. All the, she's never bought a drink a day in her life. So whatever. Well, you just okay. Just because it's true does not mean it's a bad thing. <laughs> um, it's called entrepreneurship, yeah. and I think you should learn a little bit about it. I think it's called entrepreneurship, but anyway. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You have you it. have you ever had three dates lined up on the same night? Because that would be very similar to what's happening to these documentary filmmakers. Are you the? the <laughs> Are you the amazing Jonathan in your dating story? <laughs> All right. By the way, Todd, that kind of exhale. If you're a Detroit, if you're a detective and you're uh, and you're conducting an interview with a suspect and they exhale like that, what's that tell you? Yeah, yeah, guilty, <laughs> guilty as charged. You you set up a date with the one dude. You're like, yeah, we'll go hang out, whatever. But you're not really want to go out with him. But you have nothing else better to do. The other guy hits you. You're like, oh, I'd much rather hang out with him. You know, he's not my first choice. He's better than this guy. And then by the time that time comes around to go meet him, the third one hits that you really want to go out with and next thing you know you've got all three of them strung along you've done that it's it's been over a course of a day not one night <laughs> but but it was i was i was um i started getting messages during my first date to like plan the other dates so i'm on my first date planning my other dates and it's just like it's a hard life for me and i just wish you guys would understand that uh, empathize with me a little bit uh, <laughs> I get it. I get it. You're the hey, amazing there's, 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 there's pros and cons to everything. I guess that's yeah. the point. You know, I mean, like, yeah. From now on, we're going to nick, nick, we're going to nickname your vagina the amazing Jonathan. Just so you know, it has that <laughs> same power that he has. Okay. But, but so here, so the upside, Todd, is she doesn't have to buy drinks. But the downside is that, you know, you and I, if we say hello to someone, they don't assume we want to fuck them. Right. <laughs> <laughs> True, very true. Like that doesn't occur to them. They're like, oh, he wants to fuck me. I mean, they're like, oh, hey, hello, how are you? And Savannah's like, hi. They're like, oh, that girl said hi. It's like, no, God damn it. She's just being nice because she's a nice person. Well, I wouldn't say nice person, but she's affable. <laughs> I'm friendly enough. I, yeah, I, didn't friendly wanna, I, didn't enough. Wanna, I didn't want to insult you by calling you a nice person, Savannah. That was really Thank what I, you. Where I, I stopped appreciate there. That. That. <laughs> uh, I do. I think friendly enough is a good description. I think so. I think it's fitting. 
I'm not mean by any means, but no, she's you're friendly, she's yeah. like a dog that won't bite you but doesn't want you to pet it. That's yeah. basically what Yeah, I'll let you know. <laughs> you're like, yeah, I'm not gonna pet that dog. Look at it. <laughs> So I love that. it gets worse for Ben when he reads an online um, article from an interview that Jonathan did with somebody in the media where he told that that person that Ben had to sign a document stating that he couldn't release his documentary for two years after the big film crew releases their documentary. And Ben's like, this isn't true. But where does this lead me? Like, like right. I'm really getting oh, fucked I, I, now. I, I thought it said that Jonathan signed a thing that said that he wouldn't let Ben's come out for two years. That's yeah, what jo- I thought too. Yeah, yeah. So that's what it was. So, oh, okay. So he he it, he read that Jonathan said that he signed. They made him sign a paper saying that he wouldn't let him release Ben's documentary until two years after the big one came out. Right, which he can't even control. So it's just like he's just talking out of his butt, right? I mean, it's this guy's well, no, documentary. He, 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 he released he, it when he, he wants. But he has to sign off. Jonathan has to sign off before the documentary can be released. No, he has to sign off whether he's in it or not. That's all he's well, got to sign. They, this guy can right, edit it however he wants. I mean, unless they have some pre-agreement, I guess, that's special. But I'm saying yeah. he had, as much as he had to kiss his ass at the end, and maybe maybe this is another brick in the this is fake wall, because if that's not true, but at the end he had to remember, get the thing signed and go sell it to him at the nursing home and all that right. shit. Right? I'm not so saying it can't be navigated, but I can tell you this, none of the people in Tiger King had any say when that came out. So, you know, it's not always, this is not always the case, but gotcha. Gotcha. maybe, yeah. Sense. So I think when Ben saw it, he's like, what the fuck? This guy clearly is at least saying that he's not going to cooperate with mine anymore after, yeah. after this happens. Right. So Jonathan, and he looks through Jonathan's social media. It's just full of photos of him and this big film crew hanging out with their arms, with each other, like, yeah, filming a documentary today. Nothing on Ben, right. nothing on the chainsaw juggler. So are you guys feeling bad for Ben at all? Or are you just like, hey, this is the business. This is how it works. Both. Uh, so my favorite thing about Ben is the fact that he rivals my bitch face. So like every time <laughs> every time he finds out that there's another crew or that he's been screwed over in some way. I mean, he's literally like, oh, like when he had to give his uh, um, credentials for that one theater because the other crew was already there. And that right. woman was like, I wasn't told about a second crew. I mean, he looked pissed. He did. And, and I just like every time his bitch face just like, I wish I could, I wish I could do it. I mean, it, right. is, it is spot on. So I feel bad for him. I feel bad for him in the sense that like, yeah, that sucks. You're just trying to do your job. But I don't feel that bad for him because he's not really being a shark. Like, you need to like get your ass in gear if you want to do this. Yeah. Don't just be like whiny about it the whole time. Agreed. <laughs> and he could have made he could have made Jonathan sign something that said, you know, like a no compete clause or something. Yeah. You can't be in another documentary on on this or something. But obviously Jonathan's got all the power. It's his story. So he's kind of I, I kind of respect the fact that he's hanging in there because he is up against the ropes and he is, you know, he's getting a barrage of blows. He's not able to fire back, but he's like, but if I just stay here and protect long enough, maybe I can find a way to slip in some punches as i go i respect yeah. the fact he just didn't you know pack up his shit and just leave because yeah. it, it would have been easy to do at that point but like he's already invested in this thing so yeah well i like that his buddy, his buddy had the greatest advice again two great things of advice from his friend that's now on the phone but he first said well if you leave now it's a failure if you yeah. leave in a year it could still be a failure but you've at least kicked your failure a year into the future right. <laughs> <laughs> yep. which, which i thought was a great uh, it's how far how far can we kick our failure into the future is really kind of a philosophy <laughs> i want to have like it's that's like, a really good <laughs> it's like deferring taxes just yeah <laughs> push them off right that's right. legal as long as you still pay them eventually right yeah, yeah. exactly exactly yeah. right so i love deferring failure it was a really good thing and then he did <laughs> and then he also had the second thing which was like well what's going to make this documentary unique if if there's three people doing the same exact documentary and i don't think we've met the fourth crew yet i don't even know where that is have we met the fourth crew yet that gave him the footage well we don't really ever but, meet them but first of all i want to say that i hope that your analogy on deferring taxes is legally accurate for my sake but um, also <laughs> the, the the crew, the fourth crew that comes in now. What, here's what I like about what's happening at this point in the documentary is that he's really like Ben, our filmmaker, 
which is as much about Ben as it is the amazing Jonathan, the story. So it becomes an intricate part of the story, him nav- having to constantly navigate new information and more film crews getting in the way. So he, he goes back and he kind of does a little bit of self reflection. And he's like, I, I need, I need to make my story unique because it may have to compete in the market at the same time as two other documentaries on the same fucking guy for the same fucking reason. So I need to find something unique within mine and exploit that. So he starts going back and looking at old movies that he filmed as a kid and all this. And he finds one where he's interviewing his dad, like after his mom died and asking him questions about how he feels now and all these things. It was kind of weird to be honest, but he, he was like, Oh shit. I'm, I'm kind of fascinated about death and documenting, documenting people's experiences with death. And am I doing this with Jonathan and his story? Like that was a really cool moment I thought in this thing. Well, and that's when I first thought this isn't real because I can't, no dad's ever been that candid with his 11 year old boy in the history of fucking 11 year old boys and dads. I don't think where he was like, <laughs> every day's a new challenge is your mom died and it's really tough on me and I can't really handle it. Like, well, he did have that. a glass of wine in his hand. That sometimes <laughs> helps with telling the truth. <laughs> yeah, that, that could be, but I just, it seemed it's too well scripted, especially mm-hmm. with his stupid brother jumping in the background as a, just a fat brother, like ah, rah, and his dad's like talking about how heartbroken he is and how terrible his life is because their mom's dead and he right. didn't sign up for any of this shit. It was like, uh-huh. holy fuck. It was, I mean, but it was, we but we saw his dad right before that as an older dad now. Yeah, no, his dad, and you his like dad, you can tell it's him. Like, oh, yeah, that's his no, dad. I, well, also they had Robert De Niro and the Irishman looked like he was forty. I mean, there's there's <laughs> things they can do now, but <laughs> but we got Coach Scorsese budget money now. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I'm saying if this is a f- feature film and not a documentary, we do is my sure, point. Sure, sure. Like sure. if this is a tricky feature film, like what I, I you know I watched through all the way through the credits to see if they came out and went like. Gotcha. Wasn't a real documentary. That was a movie we wrote. I was like, ah, I thought so. Right. Like I was ready for that. But like, this Uh is the first real first moment where I'm like, come on, really? Right. Right? But then also, and right before you, sorry, you were saying before with, when him, how's he going to compete? Also, when he watched the fourth documentary footage, it was from eight years ago, but it was the same exact quotes from Jonathan Mm-hmm. That he'd had in his documentary. Right. So not only was it about the same subject, just like comics learn lines that work, he was saying the same shit to all four crews. Exactly. So there's no. It's gonna be the. It's gonna be the same documentary by definition. <laughs> there's no way to make it unique if Jonathan's the subject because he's saying the same sound bites to everybody. It's like a Fox News contributor. He right. just fucking says what he's told to say, no matter what the question is to him. Yeah. It's fucking amazing. <laughs> yeah, I love how it's just all coming together. I'm like Jesus Christ. <laughs> And uh, Jonathan tells um, Ben now at one point to further complicate his fucking editing nightmare is, uh, hey, I don't want you showing any drug use in this documentary. I don't want you to show me using drugs, which was a big component of this thing, of the story, right? So at one point, you know, Ben's trying to tell him this, like, hey, I think it's important to the story. If I take it out, you know, it doesn't, you know, doesn't make sense. And he says, well, if you'll smoke meth with me on camera, then you can use all the drug use footage you want of me, you know, but you're going to have to put yourself in my shoes. You want to put yourself on camera smoking meth? All right, then you can put me on there as much as you want. If a fucking Ben consults a real law firm and asks if Jonathan's proposal is legally binding, if I smoke meth, like he said, on camera with him, then can I legally use all the drug use footage I want, regardless if Jonathan tries to renege on his on his agreement later? Like, I'm like, this this guy's really considering doing this. <laughs> well, and there's also two times during the documentary where they interview a bunch of comics about what he should do. First, when the second doc crew shows up, uh-huh. and then right now about whether he should smoke crack or not, and, or meth or not. And it was that that's really entertaining. Those guys oh are my very God. Funny. Weird Al's like, oh, I don't know, it's your movie. Do whatever you want, but I don't think I would do it. Eric Andre and Carrot Top are like, <laughs> absolutely yes, smoke meth <laughs> with the amazing Jonathan. That's incredible. <laughs> <laughs> I, Savannah, I, do you- not, I do not care about anything enough to smoke meth, regardless if it's Ooh. on camera or not. Really? Yeah, I feel that way about I feel I feel like that about bumper stickers and tattoos. I've never cared about anything enough to put it on my <laughs> right. car or my body. <laughs> I get that though. Like I disagree, but for, I get that. For any amount of money, would you smoke meth, Savannah? 
No. For a million dollars, you would not smoke meth one. You wouldn't take one hit from a meth pipe. No. For one million dollars. I get free drinks. I'm going <laughs> to get that money. <laughs> Uh, meth for people have to buy booze. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I would smoke meth for a million dollars for sure. Oh, yeah. And then I you'll buy me a oh. lot of drinks. Go on. <laughs> I would, I, if I was in Ben's shoes, I think I would have smoked meth. For one, I think it would be an incredible, like, it, to film myself. I'm in the documentary having to do that. That's fucking incredible. It's going to make your documentary so much better. Uh, but then when he goes, he like meets with Jonathan after all this, he's like, all right, man, he goes to his house. He's like, listen, I'm ready to smoke meth with you if that's what it takes. And uh, he's like, what? No, I'm not going to I'm not going to be responsible for you getting hooked on this shit. What are you talking about? We're not doing that. And, he, and then he's like, what do, you, what do you mean? Like, this was our agreement to it. And then uh, you could tell Jonathan's like, well, you know, it'd be kind of cool to have somebody to smoke <laughs> meth with. So, <laughs> so that was just his addiction kicking in. Yeah. Like, yeah, I'm going to do it right now. <laughs> so he <laughs> smokes <laughs> meth. Well, I love it was what John said this. He, after like 20 minutes, like, no, I don't want to get you hooked on this. But, but hey, I can't go back on an agreement I made. Like, he hasn't done that a million <laughs> times already. And now he's like, but I can't go back on an agreement I made. So if you want to smoke meth with me, I guess we'll do it. <laughs> 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 Plus, I mean, how many people get to say they smoke meth with the amazing Jonathan? Probably only a few thousand. So, um, <laughs> glad you caught that. Right. Yeah. <laughs> so, so, after smoking meth with the amazing Jonathan, Ben gets a call from someone that uh, he, he that had been looking into this big film crew for him on his behalf. Now, do you believe? Okay, so this is, but I'm uh, Todd. I can't believe he smoked meth on a dock. Like that's where I'm like, this is real. This isn't real. This is a movie. It's all jokes. It's a big trick. Like it just seems so contrived that somehow we got down this rabbit hole to where the fucking filmmaker is smoking meth and then still puts a black box over it and fucking doesn't show it because the lawyer from the phone book told him not to the free consultation. Does Ben not have a single lawyer friend? What, you don't have one guy who's a lawyer. I don't I mean, know. I don't know. I, I don't buy that. I don't buy he doesn't have one single lawyer friend. Right. But right. for the purpose of this documentary, he smokes the meth and he claims that he smoked the meth. Or this feature and, film that he acted very well. It's my right. That's all I'm saying. I don't know. <laughs> this, is, this is where I'm further on the side of this isn't real. But OK, so after he smokes the meth. <laughs> right. So Ben gets a call from this guy that he had kind of looking into this bigger film crew for him. And this person actually calls the producer of Man on Wire and Searching for Sugar Man, Simon Chin. And when he's talking to him, Simon Chin's like, I'm not producing a documentary on the Mason Jonathan. I don't know what you're talking about. So now the suspense builds. Like, well, what the fuck's going on here? You know, is, is Amazing Jonathan lying to us about the credits of this film crew? Or did the film crew lie to him about their credits? And we really don't find out that answer until the very, 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 very absolute end of this thing. But <laughs> two months later, he's talking with a friend um, who tells him, you're filming a documentary. I think this is the friend that uh, My same Savannah's guy. laying in a puddle in right now over. But um, <laughs> I, I, he says to Ben, look, man, you're filming a documentary on a guy who's made his entire career out of creating an illusion four <laughs> years after allegedly he was given one year to live something's up this whole diagnosis could be fabricated has that ever entered your mind so now he's kind of on board with bowers like this shit isn't real well not so much with bowers bowers thinks the whole thing might be made up ben included yes but at least on ben's behalf he's like <laughs> man you're you're being swindled here you're being you're part of the magic trick you're the guy from the crowd that he brings on stage every show to make <laughs> part the of the illusion yeah <laughs> so so what do you think now savannah like your your buddy comes forward he's like yep this is this is the deal and he always gives the best advice you're right he's always spot on well, yeah, I mean, he's a lot like me. Uh, and he just, <laughs> like, that's what, that's what, how I felt, like, when he was calling. I don't think, I still don't think Ben had anything to do with it. I don't either. I, I think that Jonathan was just bored. Uh, I mean, like, that's what he said. He said he had one year to live, and now he's bored, and he needs to do shit. Right. And, and this is his entertainment. 
Um, did, did, did anybody think he was going to die on that go-kart? Like, why was there that go-kart <laughs> shot in there? There was a whole shot about them riding go-karts, and I'm like, oh, my God. Does he die on a go kart? I know. How crazy would that be? I, I just thought it was going to be like into a wall and then he's dead, and that's the end of the talk. Yeah, that something. would be so much fun. I think he put it in there because it came right after his buddy gives him that advice. He's like, "I'm going to show some shots of him getting around a little too well for somebody that's dying of cardiomyopathy, right?" So he shows well, him racing the golf carts. They go to the to the party, and he's dancing in the background and fucking with people. And then and the, ba- I, the the bald friends like I don't know if this is still amazing. Jonathan maybe he got replaced. He said he was going to have a replacement when he died, and that yeah. could be him, or they could have never been sick. I don't think any of this is real. And now Ben's like, oh my god, what am yeah. I doing? He pulls Ben to the <laughs> side. He goes, hey man, you should give me your information. And he's like, what for? And he's like, well, let's just say someone wanted to get in touch with you and let you know what's really going on here with Jonathan. You know that that would might be useful to you. And he's like, well, what are you talking about? And he's like, well, they, they so, so they meet up later, right? And then this dude tells Ben, hey, um, he de- I thought he was just going to give a big reveal. Like, this whole thing's made up, right? Like, the diagnosis isn't real and all that. Well, he doesn't do that. He's like, no, I think it's all real. But what I'm telling you is he could pull the plug out on this thing with you at any moment. She so better get in. All the filming you can before that happens. He's even talked about disappearing, like Bowers is talking about, and replacing himself with a lookalike. Like, talks have gone that far in this thing. I don't know what's going on, but for your sake, get all the shooting done you can as quickly as possible. So now he's like, (laughs) what the fuck, man? Every time he turns around, he's getting a fucking, he's getting a dick to the head, you know? Just getting fucked (laughs) left and right. It's like a lot of parties. (laughs) Savannah's been too. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I didn't want you could tell I fought saying that, Savannah. I just couldn't hold it back. Oh, I love that. <laughs> he almost said me, and then he almost said you, and then he almost back to me. And he's like, uh, it's funny if I say Savannah because she's you can pick it on. This is her hazing. But uh, <laughs> so then he then the film comes out, the other film comes out, the other documentary crew doc comes out. So he flies to Canada to watch yeah, it. Because Jonathan it? had cut him off. Like just like the friend yeah. said, he he wouldn't return his calls anymore. Yep. So he sees he's going to be just for laughs in Canada and then go from there. Yeah. Yeah. So, so 22 people in the audience, not a good sign that this is going to be a huge documentary hit all over the world. Right. It's, also the, it's not at Cannes. It's at like Toronto Film Festival, or right. the fuck it is, <laughs> which we've had friends with fucking movies in those types of festivals. It's not yes. that tough. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, to, and then, but then I thought that I thought the sting and the Q and a again, seems like a movie seems like it's scripted too good to be true, but it was fucking perfect. When, when that when they first showed that though we were unaware that he was going to do that and so yes. like when it first started i was like if this man does not fucking stand up and ask this question i'm going to lose it like <laughs> because he'd already shown a little bit of like ballsy like we talked about earlier where i needed him to like get his ass in gear and decide he wanted to do this movie um and so when he, it looked like he was literally just going to sit there and take it and not ask questions while he's filming, right. I was so frustrated. Uh, but then that's when we we cut to the actor, and that was yeah, that was incredible. It brings in a little buddy. Yeah, he signs a release to be filmed because they're secretly filming in there. And during the Q and A, his buddy asks the film crew and the director specifically if their film process for making this film was the same film process they used for making Man on Wire and Searching for Sugar Man. And they first, they stumbled all over their answer. But basically, they did end up kind of admitting that this was their very first film. At least the director's like, this is the first film I ever directed. Basically, yeah. I didn't don't say I didn't make those movies, but <laughs> yeah, <laughs> all but said it. Yeah, I just I just wrote in all caps, got them. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so again, did Jonathan make this lie up about these guys, or did these guys lie to Jonathan? The plot thickens, and is Jonathan even sick? That's another component now that we're left wondering. Like, what mm-hmm. the fuck? Um, and Ben has so many questions he needs answered. He can't get Jonathan to return any of his calls. So finally he just calls and begs him to meet up and they do. And Ben basically just challenging him to finally tell the truth. And it's 
Very cool shot, too. They're all set up. I mean, it's very professionally done, like anything you've seen on TV. It looks like a 2020 interview with Nori, Noriega or whatever. Yeah. Like, where's the plutonium? You know, like that's kind of what it looked like. <laughs> and Ben's like, uh, you know, I'm not sure which part of your story is true and which part isn't. You know, you're you're a magician by trade. Are you pulling, you know, the, the wool over my eyes? What, what's going on? And finally, he's like, what are you talking about? And he's basically gets cornered into having to say, well, I don't don't think your diagnosis is truthful. I don't think you're being truthful about it. You're supposed to die four years ago, basically. And here you still are. And uh, Jonathan gets real offended, tells him, you know, the diagnosis is very real. And he's offended that he wouldn't even make this, he would insinuate that he would make this up just to resurrect his career. And he fucking is in the hospital constantly. He's like, this is not how I want to be living my life. Go fuck yourself. You're a fucking idiot and walks out of the interview. Yeah. And he showed us a bunch of pictures. One random thing. He showed us a bunch of pictures of how fucked up his feet are, but uh-huh. almost all of his magic tricks involve fake hands. So I don't know if maybe those are fake feet. <laughs> and this is all part of the fucking thing, man. I'm just telling right. you. It's like every uh-huh. trick was him. These aren't my real hands. I'm reading a paper over here or whatever. Like that right. was the whole fucking, that's his whole misdirect thing. So mm-hmm. I wouldn't put it past him having fake gross feet that aren't really bad. But did you believe him, I guess? Savannah, do you believe that Jonathan's really dying or do you think he's scamming Ben still? I think he might be sick, but I think he might have changed what his diagnosis was. Um, Like, I think he might be slowly dying, but just it wasn't as serious as he claimed it to be. Because I think like this is what makes it so amazing for him is that he's still alive. And like, yeah, that like kind of makes like a medical marvel almost. And that's what I mean, that's what he wants. He wants the attention. He wants the he wants the, you know, oohs and ahs over that. Right. Um, but he still so they, has to die. So they gave him 10 years to live, but he just said it was one for dramatic effect. Something basically. like that. Yeah, that makes sense. Hmm. That makes sense. All right. What do you think, Todd? Did you believe him as an interviewer? As, as, I, was, as a I wasn't believing him yet. I wasn't believing him yet. I, I was like, man, I'm still leaving room for this to all been bullshit. And he just covered himself very well by pulling the, you know, the, the biggest card you can pull when someone accuses you of that. Fuck you, man. I'm dying. And you're saying I made this up. Fuck you. You know, like he, he really made Ben feel bad. And I was like, man, did he go to the throat like that? Just because that was the quickest way to end this thing. You know, I, I don't know. I wasn't, I wasn't totally convinced. I'll say yet. I mean, the liars we've known in our lives tended to double down angrily whenever you would call them. Yes, out their lives. exactly. <laughs> exactly. That's so. why I got really disappointed with Ben. Cause I didn't really like Ben all that much. And then when he did the flying to London thing, when he did the standing up at the, at the film uh, to do the Q and a, well, I guess his actor did. Um, mm-hmm. And then I was like, yes, he's, He's growing a pair. I was so excited. And I was like, Ben, you're now the man. Uh, and then it just slowly falls apart because he gets his feelings hurt that Jonathan's yelling at him. And I'm I like, know. okay, okay. Like I got that way when my dad would yell at me as a kid. And I'm like, okay, you need to just like grow up. Right. Just yeah. handle it. Sometimes people are mad at you. Deal with it. Do your work. <laughs> I get it. I get it. And yeah, there's, um, yeah. I just noticed on the screen that I have our names in the wrong order according to where our pictures are. But it's not gonna make sense to you if you're listening to this on uh, on Apple Podcasts or wherever. But if you're watching a video <laughs> clip right now, you know what? Fixed it. Just <laughs> fixed the order. Just moved the pictures to match the, the name tags. Love it. <laughs> I love it. Love what it. I what I really feel bad about right now for Ben is that there's just no resolution to the story. Like he he's got probably realizes he has the guts of a really good documentary, but I just don't have anything to wrap it up and put a ribbon on it at the end, you know, because he just walked out of my interview. I don't want to end it like that. I look like the asshole that accused the dying guy of making up the fact that he's dying. So he take, you know, at great risks so far, I think this guy has, has really got out on the limb several times career wise, you know, during this thing. And it would come to this realization, you know, Man, this is my fault. Maybe I used because of my morbid fascination with death and people's experience with death. Maybe I'm using him. I've been using him the whole time for his own death story when he really wanted to get out his life story. You know, so maybe this is all on me. And it was like a real moment for him. 
So I, I do like people that are self-reflective like that. Like yeah. I, I, I know Savannah thinks that's weakness <laughs> and I get that, but I like, I, I like the idea of going, Oh fuck. Maybe I was a dick. Yeah. Okay, sorry. I, I, I try to see it from their perspective. And sometimes I'm like, no, I was still not a dick at that point. But like, sometimes I'm like, Oh yeah, I was, I was a prick there. You know, But I don't, I don't necessarily think that just like, if you are being a dick, that doesn't necessarily mean you're wrong either. Like, I think that's, well, that's a very, true. That this is a very like distinct. Yeah. Maybe there've been a nicer way to do it. I don't know. But that doesn't mean you're wrong in that I, scenario. I, I don't hate that. I don't hate that at all. It's, it's and, and I agree. And, it, and honestly, I think that either Jonathan's a great con man or he really is dying. But he fucking looked into Ben's eyes and he convinced Ben that he was fucking dying. And once you've called someone out for not being dying when they really are, you can't come back from that really other than go, fuck, I'm an asshole. I right. was doing this for my own. I mean, like, there's a point where you just got to I mean, you can't be like, fuck you, then die. I mean, that. Uh, OK, right. Maybe. I mean, <laughs> you right. know, I mean, <laughs> and here's so. the part that I, I fucking love. It's the biggest save I've ever seen pulled. Oh God! In someone's life, well, and this is why I, I think his, it's a real I, documentary. By the way, I loved his dad's right advice right before the thing, where his dad said, "What ending do you think would satisfy Jonathan? Like, what's the ending? And so, just do that. Like, because he's right. like, I don't know how to end. He's just do what Jonathan would want. And he's like, Oh, well, I guess I didn't thought about yeah. that. And then he pulls. Yes, this is the greatest so, save in the so history. So Ben flies to London, and he sets up an interview with Simon Chin, the producer of Man on Wire and Searching for Sugar Man, which won the two Academy Awards, one each that. The other film crew is getting credit for, however, they're getting credit for that. And he's during the interview, he's very confused at how he even got wrapped up in this thing, how his name even entered the equation. But Ben tells him that he believes now that Jonathan is indeed dying and believes that he has captured a really compelling story and asks Chen if he'll produce his movie. Now, we don't get an answer yet, but what a move flies to London chases down this award-winning producer that was giving credit for the the other crew's documentary, which wasn't deserved, and has the balls to ask him if he will produce his documentary. So I'm back Ben's, on team Ben. Yeah, back on team Ben. <laughs> like what a fucking move. And now ben, now now what part of you thinks Ben hired the second crew to <laughs> lie about their credentials and then be dick so he would have a reason to go talk to the chin guy in london once he already had it produced Stars, i need to Maybe. know i need to know where uh, i need to know where you think all of this money is coming from well this dude's already been following john around for a year and a half with those seemingly job i don't know where the money's coming from oh uh, yeah where do you think the money's coming from actually that was a question i had savannah where do you think the money comes from at all i don't know but i think i'm thinking on a much lower scale than you. Like I, <laughs> he might be really operating sure. off some grant. You can apply for documentary grants. Maybe he's operating on a little bit of a budget from that. Who knows? Maybe he's got rich parents. Probably. I think most of these guys probably have rich parents somewhere to take care of them. I don't I'm not want to judge ben. ben though. Cause I mean, he has some credits. I mean, like he, he's great at a lot of the things that he does. I also have started tweeting him and I'm waiting for a response. Oh, nice. Yeah. <laughs> So. Are you trying to go through Ben to get to his friend with the good advice or? Yeah. I, so in my first, in my first tweet to him, uh, one of the things I said was like, I, I have questions, comments, and proposals, mostly of marriage. Uh -huh. We can talk about that later, <laughs> but he has not responded yet. And I'm a little, my ego is a little bruised. Oh, well, <laughs> oh wow. his wife might look at his social media. <laughs> Yeah, maybe so, maybe she follows him on Twitter too. Um, right. Yeah. So so what I'm saying though is now this this just popped in my head and I am a little stoned again. But why he that's why he had to fog them all out so you wouldn't recognize they were his friends and colleagues and whatever. I think he hired the second documentary crew to make this thing interesting. He did six months of watching this idiot smoke meth and do nothing but get the mail, and he's like, okay, I got to fucking spice this up. So he hired a second documentary crew to fucking come in there and fuck it all up, so then he could have the, all this transition. Wow, that's, that's my, really that's complex. my official theory. That's my official no. theory. And have to tell them ahead of time that <laughs> you're going to need to claim that you made these two documentaries because I am going yep, to plan yep, to go yep. to London to yep. interview Simon yep. Chan at some point. Yep, that's right. nine steps ahead I, the whole time. It's a lot of know, layers. In what way do you think Jonathan would be able to do any of that? Well, he wasn't yeah. aware of any of it. I, they just used, no, we didn't. They just used, they just used his, his ego against him just because so, he was like, yeah, I'll have nine documentaries. I don't care. Let's go. Dis disagree. He, he, doesn't, he doesn't check facts. Oh, you, you, you have an Oscar? Yeah, let's do right. it. I'm in. Fucking cool. And they did release know. the other documentary, by the way. Now, yeah. obviously, he didn't get to play. This one did. So 
I don't know how good it was, but um, Ben finally reaches out in desperation to Jonathan. He sees that he's going to be in Detroit. Um, he's actually going there to, I don't know if that was the whole reason, but one of the reasons he was going there was to attend his mother's birthday party at this uh, senior assisted living facility. So he agrees to meet him. And um, Ben obviously has people filming there, of uh, the party and whatever. And by now, I will say visually, like Jonathan is now looking sick. He's a uh, he's probably lost fifty pounds since the previous scene we'd seen him in. He's very thin now. He doesn't look well. He's kind of uh, gray looking, and he is getting around in a rascal scooter. Yeah, I will say, put anybody in a rascal scooter, they look twenty years older and sicker. I mean, it's just something that happens in a rascal. You know, it's like you'd never get carded in a rascal. That's what high school kids should do to buy beer. They just right. drive around rascals. But they have a basket on older. the front. Yeah, that'd be great. You're making a rascal up. No one's gonna not serve you beer if you're in a rascal. Right. That's right. The <laughs> so then, Ben pulls him to another room. They have a private conversation, and he apologizes to Jonathan. Hey, dude. Sorry, I said you weren't dying, that you made the whole thing up. You know, that's my bad. I think I was trying to exploit your story in a direction that I'm morbidly interested in, which is death and all that. But he says, I'll make it up to you. Let's have some good news. Simon Chin has agreed to produce this documentary. So when you told everybody a long time ago that the guy that produced Man on Wire and Searching for Sugar Man is also going to produce your documentary, you were right. You didn't know you're right, but you're right now because he's producing my film, which was a subtle way of saying, stick that up your ass right now. Like, I just <laughs> fuck you, buddy. I really have Simon Chin. You didn't, you know? I disagree. I think he was just kissing ass. Uh, yo, you think he was kissing ass? I thought it was a little, I mean, like, for one, maybe he truly wanted to make Jonathan happy, but I thought, I thought it was his very tactful way of sitting down because his buddy's advice, like just kill him with kindness or whatever. And he's like, listen, I got great news for you, buddy. You know, everything that you did end up working out for the right way because now you are going to be in a documentary produced by a yeah. two time Academy award all, winner. All those lies you're told are going to be true. Uh, yeah, <laughs> But it's because of it. me, <laughs> not because of you, because of me, Ben. But like, <laughs> uh, I think, I think my pride would get in the way too much for that. Like, to, to make it in any way uh, Jonathan's thing, like that Jonathan uh, did any of this or pulled any of it off, I yeah. couldn't, I couldn't do it. And so I like agree. when he's sitting there and he's talking to him and like kissing ass, in my opinion, and then says like, oh, look, we're actually going to be able to have this assignment. <sighs> I, I was not on Team Ben anymore. I mean, there's a point where if I'm Ben, I get pissed off and I just put out an hour and a half documentary that's nothing but Jonathan smoking meth. Like I would just do one <laughs> scene. That it's just him constantly smoking meth I the entire that. hour and a half. Like, fuck the you, face buddy. of meth. Yeah. And it's, just, it's just an hour and a half of him in the black box around it. <laughs> <laughs> So, yeah. <laughs> but Jonathan's elated. You can tell he's actually touched. I thought like it got to him emotionally, like, Oh shit, this is real. And then he, he goes back out to the party and he gets to tell his mom the good news, which looked like she actually probably could go tomorrow. So this is good news. <laughs> and um, the, the, he, he just keeps telling everybody he, he talks to at the party about it. You just hear him in the background over and over saying, yeah, man on fire and searching for sugar, man. Yeah. Two, yeah. They got two Academy Awards. They're a big, he's a big deal. It, it, well, that's, and that's the sad part, honestly, if you see the hole in someone like that, where yes. like there's still a nine year old kid looking for approval, even, though they've been the amazing Jonathan their whole goddamn life. I mean, yes. all they've ever gotten is approval and it hasn't helped them at all. All the approval they ever got didn't give them any closer to feeling approved. It's just You're right. weird. And, and this makes the perfect ending because of that, because I thought what was interesting about his documentary so far was that it was just perfectly illustrating what a dude like that is like. And it is all about just constantly needing approval, right? That's why a lot of them succeed as entertainers to that level. Is they it drive that need for approval just drives them crazy. And now he this is like, man, this is his last moment. Like, fuck, I made it again. I never thought I was gonna ever make it again, but I made it. I'm gonna be in a documentary that has two 
Academy Award, whatever, under my belt, under their belt. And now, big deal, you only made it on Hulu, so eh, whatever. Um, <laughs> but it's still a great documentary. And I thought it was the perfect ending. I mean, what do we think at this point? I, I'm unhappy with the ending. That's You don't like it? No, I just explained the- that it just it felt too, like... Like Ben had worked so hard and I feel like he should have taken as much credit as he possibly could have to Jonathan's face. And I know that makes me a little <laughs> bitchy maybe, but like that is how, that would have been my perfect ending. But I think he made his point to us as the viewers because we watched all the hurdles he had to overcome along the way. You know what I mean? He had a lot of obstacles thrown in front of him. And what you're going to learn, too, what I think what we learned also, or he already knew at this point, is there are certain people you just can't teach, let, teach lessons to. Yes. So it doesn't even fucking make any difference. Right. So, like, right. I, I understand your need, like, show him where he fucked up. He's never going to believe that. He's never going to think that. That's not how his brain works. So you can't you, you, you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make him think he's wrong. Like, right. I just I've tried to I've tried to teach many a person <laughs> and change their fucking outlook. And most people just. They don't, they're not gonna. And that's just, okay. So why he's not going to learn his lesson. So how do we make this the most, how do we make this the easiest for everyone, including myself? Mm -hmm. Sure. I'd like to teach him a lesson, but he's 70 and he still smokes fucking meth when he's got a heart thing that probably kill him. Right. He's not going to learn a lesson. That's just not what he's going to (laughs) do. I agree. And you know, I think he wins because it's a very, very, very good documentary. I mean, I just loved it. I mean, we literally got to watch the evolution of the documentary within it, which which yeah. is unusual. I am you know? only happy that that this was what I watched for the next thirty seconds. The next thirty seconds made it worth it. Uh, <laughs> that's the, the only end. thing that that made it complete for me, and it was so funny, and my jaw dropped. What's the next thirty coming. seconds? Let us know. Uh, he gets a call from Simon. Uh, ben gets a call from Simon and that original crew actually, they did uh, get camera equipment from his business partner in LA. So he was kind of connected to the other crew. Yeah. And that was perfect. <laughs> I mean, they were telling the truth the way a comic that says he's been on the last comic standing because they yes. scanned by the line and he was yeah. in the line. I mean, it's, it's true. I mean, they, that's what we're talking about right now with all the stuff in America. Like, we're just letter of the law, not spirit of the law, right? Like, right, right. doctors are like, stay six feet apart. We put stickers six feet apart from everything in America. And they're like, well, that's just a guide. Like, no, you said six feet. We're fucking six feet. Fuck you. I'm right. going to Denny's. Right? Like, <laughs> like so that's. that's really- <laughs> exactly like dude i mean and now that finally is oh they were lying it wasn't even jonathan so there was a little bit of redemption in my mind for jonathan because he was duped i mean these guys were like yeah um i don't know if you watched man on wire uh or searching for sugar man two of the most you know decorated documentaries in the last 20 years to be produced but we're the same crew and what they should have said was but these cameras were used a lot of them during that filming because <laughs> the producer's business partner loaned them to us. <laughs> See, that makes me team that crew. Like right. the way they spun that. Oh, what geniuses. Big spin, big spin. Now, see, here's my thing. Uh, Man on Wire is one of my favorite Denzel Washington movies. I didn't know it was a documentary till this till this documentary. <laughs> that might be Man on Fire. It's oh, Man on Fire. Yeah, yeah, oh, yeah. oh, my bad, my bad. Okay, those are, those are different. Okay. I swear to God, the first three times they said it, I thought, it was like, oh, that was a documentary. No, that can't be a thing. <laughs> Again, I was high, but I was very confused for a little bit until I looked I, it up. And I'm like, oh, no, that was that guy that crossed the skyscraper. Yeah. <laughs> I've seen both those documentaries, and those are two. Uh, we should cover them on here. They're, they're, I don't know why that didn't occur to me, but both are awesome documentaries. So right. yeah, the other one is um, the Searching for Sugar Man. I don't know if you know the story about it, but there was this dude. It was a very, very much like a Bob Dylan-type musician in the 70s, and this, he was up and coming. Then all of a sudden – he just disappeared into into the abyss. No one ever heard of him. In fact, everybody just assumed he died because he just disappeared. And then time goes on. His music becomes so big in South Africa. There's this huge following that two filmmakers from down that way were like, you know, never, no one ever said what happened to him. And they couldn't really find us. So they started investigating. They find him just working construction, very anonymous, modest living in some city. 
living in a shitty little apartment. And they're like, did you know that you're famous in South Africa? And he's like, what are you talking about? And they start showing him all this shit. And he's like, oh, holy shit. So they 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 get a whole tour going. Like they revive his career. He goes and does concerts in South Africa and gets super rich off of it. Super like it's cool. the most oh, incredible wait, did, story of all time. Wait, was was he given a year to live? Because I think I saw a documentary a lot like this. <laughs> it's very much like this. That's why I bought into the fact that it was the same film crew. I'm like, this is right up the alley. These are the kind of stories they tell, like comeback yeah, yeah, stories yeah. before. Um, yeah. So um, I thought, I mean, I thought it was great. Do we have heroes in zeros for this one? Uh, yeah. Yeah. Who, who, who's your hero, Todd? Um, my hero is going to be, I think, uh, his dad. Because I think his dad's advice, and but by the way, having to put up with a weird little kid who wants to film you constantly about after your wife dies and how you feel about it, just going through that, he's a hero. And, <laughs> but also, I think he gives the perfect advice at the perfect time when he said, you know, what? Can, what how do you think Jonathan would want this story to end? That's going to make the best ending for this documentary. So I'm going to make the dad my hero. The zero, I'm going to make... Um, Oh, I think Weird Al Yankovic for not being on board so much for him smoking meth. I think he should have jumped on with the other comics and and rallied him to smoke meth with the amazing Jonathan. All right. So, Savannah, who's your hero and who's your zero? Hero is obviously John Ben's best friend, or at least good friend. Because <laughs> mm, uh, he makes you wet. Got it. Yeah, a little bit. Um, uh, and Zero's got to be John's wife, Jonathan's wife. She's an enabler. She's an enabler. She's yeah. whiny. She doesn't get it. Um, it didn't like her. I like when they were fighting that one moment and he's yelling at her from the from the shitter. And uh, she she's kind of criticizing him. And he's like, you know, her life, having to deal with what she deals with. And he's like, oh, yeah, what a tough life. You sit around and do nothing. And everything's paid for you. I wish I had that life. Yeah. And she was like. She takes a drink. He goes, I don't even know what to say to that. Basically, like, got me. You're right. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> All right, Bowers, who's your hero? Who's your zero? Well, my hero, if this is a real documentary, is the wife for not just murdering him some night to get his money, but to actually <laughs> stick around with him this long, even though he's a pain in the ass. Uh, though my second place was the friend. I thought he had he had really great advice. Um, but my third place might actually be meth for keeping Jonathan alive this long. That might be. <laughs> uh, giving us without, a story. Without meth, this heart would have given out long ago. Um, zero, I got to go with the other film crew that wouldn't let, if those were not hired by by Ben and was were in fact just dicks. I think they were just dicks. Like let him film you guys filming this thing. I mean, like, right. cause it was kind of cool when we saw the fucking chainsaw guy and the other shit, you know, like him filming and the questions he asked Jonathan and how the John, I mean, I liked the behind the scenes of a documentary being made kind of a documentary thing too, mm -hmm. which was kind of cool. Yeah. So the fact that they wouldn't let him putting that in there and we're kind of dicks about camera positions and stuff. I'll give those guys the zeros unless they were, um, you know who I hired. should have considered and I didn't for the hero was Simon Chen because yeah. he ended up giving the perfect like resolution to this whole thing. Oh, that's fair because that's you know, well, part. you know what? And then he also admitted that, yeah, I, I kind of was attached to this. I was wrong earlier. Yeah, Where yeah. Most people wouldn't even make that call. They'd be like, oh, right. I don't want to tell anybody that. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right. Like, yeah, so granted, was, uh, they exaggerated a lot, the affiliation I have. But yeah, technically, there was some involvement there. Now, but now, if this, if this, was, I just think it's so ironic that the first, the big cruise documentary, no one fucking has ever seen it. Right. You know, it's like I had 25 people that watched it. And then his is a big ass deal. It's on Hulu and ends up actually getting produced by the producer of Man on Wire and searching for Sugar Man. I mean, that's just irony at its best. I, th I think here's what we need to do. If we can find that other documentary and it exists and it's and you can watch it in its entirety on Amazon Prime or whatever, uh -huh. then I will believe that this our documentary was real because they wouldn't make two full documentaries for this. I mean, maybe they would for a magic trick because that's what magicians do. Uh -huh. um, if this is all a scripted show and this was all a trick, then I give the hero to the entire production crew and the writers and everything. And I am the zero if they right. got me, but like, right. I can't, uh, there are like three know. listed on Google. I have it open in the links to see if they're actually viewable or whatever, but I know that if you Google it, you find three documentaries on 
the amazing yeah, talent. But I'm just are they are they eight minutes long? Just enough for that film festival for our our cameras and our gotcha right. moment, or is you know, it the whole thing? Bowers, a wise man once told me that you can uh, lead a horse to water, but you can't make him drink it. And I feel <laughs> yeah, like this yeah. is that moment for you. <laughs> <laughs> no, I get that, I, and I just like the fun theory of it. But I mean, it, but yeah, I mean, I, 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 but I still, I still, there's part of me if they came out five years later and were like, ha that was all a joke, I'd be right. like, oh, okay, you did it really well because I yeah. believed you. Because it you only know? just everything was in shambles, and it just worked out so perfectly. It is kind of hard to believe that the things that happen that way. Nothing in my life ever happens that way. You know what I mean? If right. it starts off and it's if it starts to fall apart, it just completely falls apart. <laughs> no one's ever like, oh, no, look, boom, you're famous now. You know, yeah, that's not what happened. Well, that's and, and what it comes down to is I have a, we have a magician friend. One time we had him on our podcast and we we're talking about, well, how do magicians do that? He goes, the reason magic works is because magicians do things you wouldn't fucking expect people to go out of their way to right. do. Like whatever you think would be the hardest way to do something, that's exactly how they fucking did it. It's not magic. Like, and and so I told like I was like, I asked him this specific trick. I saw David Blaine do where he throws a thing of cards at a window and the cards and then one sticks, it's the guy's card and it's on the outside of the window. Mm-hmm. And I said, Well, how do you do that? And Nick goes, Well, what would you do? And I go, well, I'd, I'd fucking have a guy laying under there. And when it hit, he'd slap it up there. But that seems crazy. You're not going to have a guy lay under the window all day. He's like, that's exactly what they probably did. Like, oh, that, wow. whatever you don't expect them to do is what they're going to do. So my point is yeah. to hire a second crew so that you'll have a fucking bad guy in your movie that doesn't have a bad guy. It's just a guy going to get the man. Maybe that is something that's kind of a magic illusion trick. This is about illusions. Right. That's where I kind of. You know, you already got me thinking that way when magic might be real. You know what I mean? I know, I know. It could be. It could be. We might get surprised here, you know, one of these (laughs) days. I did, though. He did look very, very sick in that last scene. So that that kind of I did believe that he really has the cardiomyopathy and that he probably outlived his the life expectancy. You know, it happens sometimes. I'll give Bowers a slight bit of rope, I guess. The. I feel like maybe they exaggerated the way he looked, possibly, for the end of that. Like, I'm not totally against the idea that they didn't embellish. Right. Uh, I mean, we both had it. Bowers and I had a, a comedian friend who was diagnosed with throat cancer, and he had a, a grapefruit-sized tumor when they found it. And they were like, listen, if we don't cut out everything in there, you know, including your vocal cords and all that, you're going to die within inside of a month. And uh, he's like, well, fuck you. You're not cutting my vocal cords. And he went on this uh, low alkaline or no alkaline diet and lived like two and a half years, right? Or almost three years, I think, past that date. So it it does happen, you know. So why couldn't it have happened to the amazing Jonathan? I mean, he's got – he see all those pills. Maybe they found the right mixture to stave that thing off a little bit. And maybe meth. Maybe you're right. It might be meth. It might be the one thing meth. Be. The one thing meth fucking helps, and he's the yeah. one guy who could tame it because most guys can't. I mean, again, that's the most impressive thing about Amazing Jonathan is he seems to have tamed meth because he didn't uh-huh. do all the stuff meth people do. Like he didn't have all the clocks taken apart in his house. He wasn't full of scar- scabs and stuff. He wasn't like he didn't overdo it. He just right. did it enough to like make him functional, and that's fucking crazy. He he did meth like people drink coffee. I know. And he told his lady, you know, I don't even feel high when I do it. So maybe his heart was fucked up enough that this really just got him to, you know, level ground. Maybe and he's, he's, methro- even he's, he's, he's methro dosing. Yeah. Ah. <laughs> oh, I forgot Santa, Savannah hates puns. Uh, <laughs> right there at the end. <laughs> that was not cool. <laughs> <laughs> F minus. <laughs> <laughs> All right, guys. Well, this has been a good one. I do recommend that you watch The Amazing Jonathan on Hulu. I think it's a crazy good story. Uh, very well done. And the producer is an Academy Award winner. So there you go. <laughs> I would say watch it too. Savannah, I think, says don't watch it, but we got two watches and one don't. So we were two. What do you think, Savannah? What's your, you you I, yes or no? If you, if you get easily frustrated, don't watch it. <laughs> if you don't like surprises or things that are cool or fun, yeah, don't watch yeah. it. Uh, I didn't say that, but yeah. I'm That's also exactly what you said. Well, I'm also the only one who's not high currently, so. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think it has anything to do with that. I think you have a very, some people are like that. Some people have a very simple palate and they like things very easily digestible. They don't like surprises and turns and all that. There's nothing wrong with it. 
I think you should embrace it. I don't think there's anything wrong with that. I'm very happy with the way that I am. (laughs) What's your favorite meal? Oh, um, oh, I I like steak. Steak? Okay. Say it's it's, it's pretty simple. What's your your favorite movie? That's a good question. Yeah, yeah. The the Lion King. Okay. Well, enough said, I think. (laughs) This is... This wasn't animated, so it's not for you. If you like, if you don't like documentaries and aren't animated, don't watch this for sure. Yeah, I'm on board. That's a good statement. All right, guys. We'll see you next week. We'll try to let you know ahead of time. Savannah's probably going to be back, I think. Are you busy next week, Savannah? Or are you back? I'm good. Okay, so she's going to be back. We'll try to let you know in advance, even though we didn't this time. We'll try to make a regular thing of letting you know at least a couple of days in advance what the documentary is in case you want to watch it ahead of time. Otherwise, just be like us. Just just learn from us and then decide if you want to watch it or not. We like, we like doing that as well. <laughs> uh, make sure that you rate and review this podcast. We need your help with that. Get us back up on the radar. Um, so do that as often as possible and share it with your friends on social media and holler at Savannah on social media at Savvy Thing, S-A-V-V-Y-T-H-I-N-G because she's difficult at Savvy Thing on Twitter and anywhere else. Are you only on Twitter? Yeah. Uh, and, but you can find her on Facebook as well. If you like to slide into her DMs, if you watch the video, you probably will. Um, other than that, you know where to find me at Todd McComas <laughs> at Bowers Comedy. Look for us to do a show near you sometime soon. We are out.